variety show. Uh, unbeknownst to us, John Davis is still participating in the variety show. Uh, and that brings us up to tonight. So, we, uh, we have a slightly smaller uh, set tonight. We have four <coughs> different performances. Uh, we'll start with some music from David Charbonneau. We're going to horrify you with something after that. And then I will give a science lecture. And then there is the real life of the royals. And after that, I think it's 2015. So, without further ado, we will begin with the noted guitarist, singer, songwriter, Nothing. local <laughs> musician and jack of all trades, David Charbonneau. All right. Yay!
I don't know, getting, I don't know, what would we call it? Polite? Or ordinary? Or acceptable? Acceptable. I will present our next piece. All I'll say is write it out and wait for the next piece. <laughs> John Davis has Yay! something to share. This is sort of a continuation of a tradition we started a couple of years ago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, maybe I'm a little sentimental, but... We'll be it for one year. You know, let's be embark on another calendar year. It, it's a time to kind of reflect on the things that are important in life. And, and, and some of those things are like family and loved ones and significant others, all kinds of things at this important time. And once again, I'd like to to help us think about those things in both the words of the great Irish writer James Joyce, who wrote the Ulysses, Finnegan's Wake, the Dubliners. And I think when you hear some of these letters he wrote to his future wife-to-be, uh, you'll not just be sort of impressed with the sheer virtuosity of the prose, but his actual depth of feeling <laughs> and might help you keep to think of things as we enter into the next Did year. Into <laughs> 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 That's the way Tony talks about it. And so, uh, uh, so I'll just give you one example. Here's something that is to Nora Barnacle, is his wife-to-be, and this is written in <laughs> August 31st, 1909. And uh, it goes this way. My darling, it is now nearly two in the morning. My hands are shivering with cold, for I've had to go out to bring home my sisters from a party, and I must walk down to the GPO. But I do not want my love to be without her letter in the morning. It is perhaps an art, Nora, dearest, that you and I will find solace for our own love. I would wish you to be surrounded by everything that is fine and beautiful and noble in art. You are not, as you say, a poor, uneducated girl. You are my bride, darling, and all I can give you of pleasure and joy in this life I wish to give you. Nora, darling, let our love as it is now never end. You understand now your strange, erring, willful, jealous lover, do you not, dearest? You will try to hold him in all his wandering moods, will you not, dearest? He loves you. Believe that always. He has never had a particle of love for anyone but you. It is you who have opened a deep chasm in his life. Every coarse word and speech offends me now, for I feel that it would, be, uh, it would offend you. When I was courting you, and you were only 19, darling, how I love to think of that. <laughs> you have been to my young manhood what the idea of the Blessed Virgin was to my boyhood. Oh, tell me, my sweet love, that you are satisfied with me now. One word of praise from you fills me with joy, a soft rose-like joy. Our children, much as I love them, must not come between us. <laughs> if they are good and noble natured, it is because of us, dear. We met and joined our bodies and souls freely and nobly, and our children are the fruit of our bodies. Good night, my dearest girl, my little Galway bride, my tender love from Ireland. How I would love to sur surprise you sleeping now. There is a place I would like to kiss you now. A strange place. <laughs> <laughs> Not on the lips, Nora. You know where? <laughs> Good night, beloved. Yeah. <laughs> now, save for the last couple of lines. <laughs> A few months later, in December 1909, he writes another letter to his future bride, and it goes this way. My darling, I ought to begin by begging your pardon, perhaps for the extraordinary letter I wrote you last night. While I was writing it, your letter was lying in front of me, and my eyes were fixed, as they are even now, on a certain word in it. There is something obscene and lecherous in the very look of the letters. The sound of it, too, is like the act itself, brief, brutal, irresistible and devilish. Darling, do not be offended at what I wrote. 
You thank me for the beautiful name I gave you. Yes, dear, it is a nice name. My beautiful wild flower, wild flower of the hedges. My dark blue rain-drenched flower. You see, I am a little of a poet still. I am giving you a lovely book for a present, too. And it is a poet's present for the woman he loves. But... Side by side and inside the spiritual love I have for you, there's also a wild beast-like craving for every inch of your body, for every secret and shameful part of it, for every odor and act of it. My love for you always, uh, uh, excuse me, my love for you allows me to pray to the spirit of eternal beauty and tenderness mirrored in your eyes or to fling you down under me on that soft belly of yours and fuck you up behind. <laughs> like God right All right. Down, glorying in the very stick and sweat a stink and sweat that rises from your arse, glorying in the open shame of your upturned dress and white girlish drawers, and in the confusion of your flushed cheeks and tangled hair. It allows me to burst into tears of pity and love at some slight word, to tremble with love for you at the sounding of some chord or cadence of music, or to lie heads and tails with you, feeling your fingers fondling and tickling my ballocks are stuck up in me behind, in my behind, and your hot lips sucking off my cock while my head is wedged in between your you fat thighs, my hands clutching the round cushions of your bum, and my tongue licking ravenously at your rank red cunt. I call you almost a swoon at the hearing of my voice singing or murmuring to your, your soul the passion and sorrow and mystery of life, and at the same time I've taught you to make filthy signs to me with your lips and tongue to provoke me by obscene touches and noises, and even to do in my presence the most shameful and filthy act of the body. You remember the day you pulled me, uh, pulled up your clothes and let me lie under you, looking up at you while you did it? Then you were ashamed even to meet my eyes. <laughs> you are mine, darling, mine. I love you. All I have written above is only a moment or two of brutal madness. The last drop of seed has hardly been squirted up your cunt before it is over in my true love for you. The love of my verses, the love of my eyes for your strange, luring eyes, comes blowing over my soul like a wind of spices. My prick is still hot and stiff and quivering from the last brutal drive it has given you when a faint hymn is heard rising in tender, pitiful worship of you from the dim cloisters of my heart. Nora, my faithful darling, my sweet-eyed black guard schoolgirl, be my whore, my mistress, as much as you like, my little frigging mistress, my little fucking whore, or always my beautiful wild flower of the hedges, my dark blue rain-drenched flower, Jim. <laughs>
everybody!
So we'll carry on. We'll look a little bit at the mid-oceanic ridges. The mid-oceanic ridges are very cool. There's, there's the mid-Atlantic. It's kind of the coolest one. The best part of this uh, is middle of the ocean. You get these black smokers that are two vents that are laying out nutrients and fresh lava. And it's the birth of new continental stuff in the middle of the ocean. You have two worms, all the stuff going down there. But in Iceland, way the hell up there, the mid-Atlantic ridge goes right through Iceland, and you can walk down the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So this is the European mm -hmm. plate, and that's the Atlantic plate, and the people can walk in the middle. And you walk there, and ten years from now, it's going to be a half an inch wider than it is today. Who's with me? Where are we here? <laughs> Who this wants to go? Who's with me? I'm <laughs> in. So then we're in Iceland here. This is Iceland. This is, Iceland. The, this is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where it goes above the ocean through Iceland. So they, that is they're walking through the gap between two continents, and that is seafloor spreading happening above ground. So, uh, next slide. Uh, so, the, how did we get to this theory of seafloor spreading from the old idea that Wegener had of the moon pulling continents around like icebergs floating in the ocean? How did we get to this theory? This is the question. So, these guys back in the uh, late 50s, early 50s, 60s were doing World War II technology that they had for looking for submarines. They were coming off the back of the boat. Yeah. Can you tell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were doing uh, technology to look for submarines, so they were looking for magneto they had magnetometers that would detect the uh, magnetic field of the Earth. And they're showing these things. Very important. And so, next slide. So what's going on, of course, is you have the black smokers in the middle of the the ocean. Dianetics. What's really going on is dianetics. <laughs> you know, new lava being formed. So the lava, of course, is cooling. Bad, bad so, boy. Next slide. So what is happening when the lava is cooling? Most of the Earth is made of iron and silica. So iron will align itself to a magnetic field. So, so here we have... Well, next slide. All right. Here we have the Earth's magnetic field. Now things get interesting. With the Earth's magnetic field, now this is all about how did we prove plate tectonics. So we have the magnetic field. And so next, uh, so okay, wait, wait. Digression. Go back to the last slide. Isn't that <laughs> fucking cool? <laughs> the next thing, like, Next slide. The illustrators, these Not poor the schmucks sitting the around at desktops all Korea day the long. Look at. Does, does that look exciting to you? No. So we're going to give a little love to the illustrators here because nobody's ever seen like tectonics, much less a magnetic field. So let's just have a look. Next slide. Earth's magnetic field. It's kind of cool, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see what we got. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Let's keep going. What do we got? Ooh. Fucking hey, it's a death star. Ooh. Like these guys, like this is illustration. Those are just sea animals. <laughs> like that, it's cool. Whoa. Oh my god. Whoa. Uh, where were we? <laughs> oh yes, uh, next slide. Um, so, the Earth's magnetic field. I don't know if you know this. The Earth's magnetic field has flipped. North and south poles have flipped hundreds of times. There's been long periods of time. So this over here is a bar graph showing when the north was up versus down. And there's big areas where just for millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, the Earth's mag magnetic field stayed one way. But there's other times where literally in 50,000 years, the Earth's magnetic field flipped ten times. Now, what, wait, go back, go back. So here we have a, sh a shot of a reconstruction of force lines as the Earth's magnetic field is flipping. So literally, you would have a compass that used to point to north, and it would then point south. Professor, yeah. is that the same, when you talk about that, is that the same as polarity? Is yeah, that, that the Earth's polarity no, is switching. No, officer. The, 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 <laughs> <laughs> this happens a lot, and this is important. So next slide. So back to these dudes. These dudes are cruising around peeing off the back and of the peeing off the boat. So next slide. <laughs> so back to the lava that's cooling with iron in it. So what happened was these guys who were trolling around looking at the Earth's magnetic field came up with this map. This is a very famous image. 
because what the red is, is rocks where the little pieces of iron cooled and crystallized with their little iron particles pointing north. Oh. And the white is spots where the iron crystallized with north pointing south. Mm. And this is a fault. So next slide. And they figured out, there's the fault in there, same spot, same scan, that the rocks were older as they went across from there. And here we have a little diagram of it, of new stuff coming up, the yellow stuff, the yellow stuff is then out, and you have orange, and then the red stuff is up. So, they figured out that because the Earth's polarity was switching, that when the iron in the lava cooled and pointed north or south and made horizontal bands, they figured out the ocean was spreading. And if the ocean was spreading, that proved that continents could be drifting. And it's all based on mm. magnetic fields. Next slide. So, there's a thing, there's Iceland North Atlantic. One more call out to the graphic designers. What a fucking beautiful image, right? <laughs> and... How oh, the next slide. grip was proven. <laughs> The gold trip back together. They're going. They're going. What? They're going. Just it's, it just takes a lot of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have one more presentation tonight. Let's, uh, yeah. Break this down here. It's 11:39. We got time. We're on. Hang on. Nobody go anywhere. Still recording. Don't let the North Koreans mess up your evening. Stick with the program. I'd like all the actors of the play to gather over on the fireplace line. Just who are you? Molly, you take the who was the main character? Somebody who's going to have to sit on the floor. Yeah, that was the one. Oh, yeah. Punch on. 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 All right, brave audience, I introduce to you Molly, the narrator of the Real Life Royals. We're presenting a short play by James Lyon. Called the Real Lives of the Royals, Part Two. Part One was last year, and Part Three might be next year. Welcome to our the outward daily drudge of royal duty masks the myriad manipulations of the few who aspire to power and privacy. So we proceed. These are the real lives of the royals. <laughs> the story told a year ago, the royal boy George was born, which begat the plot by Queen Elizabeth. Where is the picture? <laughs> uh, which be begat the the plot by Queen Elizabeth to keep the royal house on a traditional path. In confronting democratizing forces in Windsor that threaten, by their success, to end the monarchy. She's now in the tower, arrested for conspiring to remove baby George from this world. She now finds her own self restricted to a cell in the tower. Camilla, her understudy as Dean of Discipline <laughs> for the regime, is to be regent with Charles the Unaware. <laughs> until baby George reaches his majority. Or, or is she? The Real Lives of the Royals. Act One, Scene One. Commercial break. Which is with Charles and Camille. <laughs> Do that. A room at Windsor Park. <laughs> My mother is in the tower, but she still plagues me. She would have me oversee the growth of precious baby George. Overlook me as heir to the throne. <laughs> <laughs> I am the firstborn son, and she would dance on my birthright. The law will back my side. 
a lot in the book. The little in the backside. It's a dream to take. The people of Britain will not light fight. and fight. fight a monarchy when there is no monarchy to fight. The dream of a thing is often better than the thing itself. One speaks no dis no division when one speaks not. We have a a score. We have a school of years left, and with that power, but not responsibility, Britain is sweet meat for us to eat, <laughs> <laughs> and the people will dream of their future king. George is Arthur and Alfred, Edward and Henry V. He is unknown and thus pure. He is George, who will slay the dragon and keep alive the dream of Windsor. <laughs> and you, my dear, will make this happen for us. Or else. Say it. In an adjacent room at Windsor, William and Kate. <laughs> oh, that was <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, William, our son, the baby George, is returned. And grateful I am to your handsome and brave brother, Harry. <laughs> the jewel is back in our crown, but the crown is still on the head of she who did this. The hag beastess who would have me bypass? <laughs> <laughs> she bears enmity to my Spencer line, which runs red with the blood of the folk of England. <laughs> Not blue with that imperial Teutonic hue. He's good. He's good. <laughs> <laughs> He's been practicing. What else? Be not so moved by spleen. Consider Regency. The price is small. The profit, not small. <laughs> My baby George is our ticket. First class. Your father left in the waiting room. <laughs> we are then with some liberty, and I become the king mother. Inside to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> a mother to a king in waiting, or a wife to a king? What burden does she carry? Does a wife exert more power over a husband or a son? One can be undone by the whim of the Lord, the stroke of the magistrate's pen, one cannot. So a king's mother, more noble, and in that term, less demeaning and less burdensome, I say than a king's wife. Aye. Aye. In the palace, would we live... We who should be regents or claim above your father's is <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, above your father's is closer to George, who will never again be separated from us. My fond Kate. <laughs> you come from humble birth. I do. <laughs> I am born to be king. <laughs> Neither my aging father, nor the cherished baby George, <laughs> will usurp my rightful place. Granny is in the tower. Mark me. She needs no company. Ooh. This scandal will damage our brand, and it's time to bring this pendulum to even rhythm. Do not shake its mountings, or tremulous vibrations may quick the foundations of our position. Ooh. 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 King James. <laughs> <laughs> Estelle is a power of light. She's Camilla and QE2. <laughs> 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 oh, Camilla, what news? Will I be beheaded or worse? Sent to America. Charles <laughs> 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 would sell you to the French. Oh, they can have my head, but my body is too old to travel. <laughs> <laughs> we are moving to the palace. Charles accepts the reason. We will have you diagnosed as 
senile, pardoned, and retired to Sangringham. I'll come every weekend. We can run things from there. Okay. But what of the Spencer's Thorn, William and Harry? Those boys will be deployed to Syria, where things are <laughs> imprecise. <laughs> friends can describe it. They, uh, the end of George's father will be heroic, as befits your grandson. Very well, very well. A Roman answer. Bravo. Princes William and Harry. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'm being ousted, and as I go, so go you. Brother William, my position remains. King I never was or would be. I'm secure in my unambition, but I can help you. On wilding days, the paparazzi have caught me with my trousers down. <laughs> I know a man, Mr. Tabloid, he has evidence that would undo our father. He who abandoned our beloved mother, Diana. Mm. And my wife. She favors the Regency and is uh, under a spell from our witch grandmother. <laughs> we think she uses you. Do you not feel it? Are you sleeping at night? A man sleeps well who has support. Perhaps you cannot sleep. In such a case, there's a flea in your bed. Is there a flea in your bed, brother? <laughs> <laughs> My father's disgrace will not hurt him. His reputation can only be enhanced. Dirty deeds will dispel his nice facade, but disallow his regency. So one boulder in my path will roll aside, and with him that Camilla, she's thick with aristocracy, a ritual cow ready for ritual deep <laughs> Such elitism ties us to duty beyond reason. We have kings without power. And there is power without kings. A paradox. No. A question the thinking man must ask. Why a queen, a king? It exists, it is culture. The person is not the person. The person is unity. A unity of place. Place represented. But privileged. As gold is privileged among metals by rarity and rare beauty. The king is alone and privileged. Not a god, a god can be appealed to. For redress of wrongs, eternal life and a good harvest. A king cannot escape his singleness. A king is the banner we fly for hope. And I will be that banner. My wife stands in my way, a shade darkening my path. <laughs> <laughs> Though love for me she may still harbour, she will not love me further ere the choice I make to prevent my son usurping the right to the throne. My son is mine, my wife is not. Find me evidence. This ingrate stands against me. Brother, brother, where are you gone? <laughs> you here? Thank you for coming.